So we're going to talk about a journey from the future back. I'm going to take you to 2030 and really explore what the future would look like. Three things we're going to explore in the next 45 minutes. Firstly, what does that future look like? What will happen in your future? Secondly, really thinking about who are the disruptive innovators today who are going to create that future. It could be you. And then thirdly, what do leaders need to do? So all of us are business leaders here in this room. What do we need to do if our companies and if we are going to be the leaders of the future? So let's think about the future. I think we live in an incredible time. The next 10 years, the next 10 years will see more change than the last 250 years, I believe, which is just phenomenal. I mean, if you think about 250 years, the steam engine, the telegraph, the light bulb, the telephone, how did that change society? How did it change people's lives? So the automation of manual process into factories, for example, the coming together of people who lived in the countryside into cities, the ability to work across countries and travel and connect across the world. And then we had the man on the moon. It changed our dreams as to what was possible. And then we had this 24 years to now of a digital revolution. So a first, a second, and a third industrial revolution. But that's the past. I believe we'll see more change than all of that in the next 10 years, which some people call the fourth industrial revolution. You know, I spend a lot of my time going to companies all around the world, partly because I write books. It's a great way to talk to people, but also to help them to create the future. One of the companies I went to was SpaceX. Has anybody been to SpaceX? Yeah? Hawthorne, California. I went in the factory, and I was talking to some of the people who work in the factory. I said, what do you do? What do you do? All of them said, we're going to Mars. We're going to Mars in 2025. They believe it. It's like a religion. They truly believe that that's going to happen. So they have a dream of the future which they truly believe in. And everything which SpaceX does is about working towards that dream. So what will the future look like in 2030? Who knows? But here's some ideas. That's just one person's vision. But many, many futurists across the world are all thinking about what are the trends, what are the signals, what are the flows of innovation 
which will take us to a new future. Actually, there's three industries more than any other which will change the most in the next 10 years. One is transportation or mobility. The second one is healthcare. And the third one is space. So think about those three industries. Here you have a map of some of the trends. It's crazy. It's, it's impossible to read. Start from the inside, work outwards. The trends closest to the center are the ones which are happening now most, and then you work outwards. It's too much to understand now. What's interesting is the connection points, where trends connect with other trends. And so you start to see what matters most to people, to human beings, to consumers. And that's actually the best place to start. But also, as we think about what is new, what would be interesting is to start to think about what will stop. So when will it be the end of certain things which we see today, which is normal? So the end of computers is estimated within the next seven years. The end of oil within the next 10 years. The end of glaciers within the next 12 years. I was in China recently. I saw the end of money. I saw people using e-payments everywhere. I even saw a beggar on the street asking for money. But not money, he had a QR code. <laughs> he had a QR code, he was asking for e-payments. Money was useless to him. So you think about how the world is changing, and you look for the trends across the world. So thinking where those trends are, and what is likely to happen when. This matters to all of us, because we can start to prepare for it. So just think about some of the aggregated understanding of what it's to look like in the future. So we start from 2030 and we work backwards to now. Then we will see huge things. So just some examples of what is most likely to happen when. So from 2030, not 2025, but 2030, we're more likely to see human beings living in a civilization on Mars. By 2029, the brain will be the main controlling device. Interesting for Kaba. But think about how does that mean we actually connect with the world and connect with each other? By 2028, asteroid mining will be one of the most important industries. China by then will be the largest economy. So you can see Saudi Arabia, China becoming dominant both on Earth and in space. 2027, DNA profiling, the ability to understand our bodies, our past, our future, will be available to everybody. It's currently available at $99. 2026, driverless cars will dominate. They'll be normal. So not that far away, only eight years. 2025, you've probably got 3D printed food in every restaurant, in every home. Not all of it, but some of it. By 2024, we'll probably have vertical farming, which you've started to see now, particularly in the hottest parts of the world. And as the temperatures rise and the ice caps melt, then the, the, the deserts of the world will become the new greenhouses. 2023, microproteins, that means insects, will become normal in your diet. They're really healthy for you, and they taste good. Promise me. Um, India, by then, will be the largest nation in terms of people. Wireless electricity, we will not see switches anymore. We will not see light bulbs anymore. You'll just get a light in the middle of your room, which is not connected to anything. Think about what that would look like. First asteroid landing leading to that future industry. 2021, Hyperloop, more about that in a minute. And by 2020, that's just 18 months away, we'll all be able to access bionic eyes. They're coming very, very soon. So this is science fiction to some extent, but it's worth thinking about what does that mean for us? And when should we start to influence what we do in our strategies and our innovation in order to think about the future? Because the future starts today. That's the important thing. What we start doing now influences our future. It won't just happen, it'll only happen if we make it happen. So if we choose through our innovations to make these things happen. So just think right now, in 2018, what is happening across the world? So just in the last six months, some of the things I personally have seen 
happening in the world which are clues towards that future. Well, I was in Saudi Arabia. Sophia from Singapore. You've met Sophia? You will soon. She's a humanoid robot. She came on stage with the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. I am very pleased to be here. Please welcome the Crown Prince. I am now a Saudi citizen. So it's not real, okay? So it's human, but it's robotic. Actually, most robots are just simple arms and things doing simple tasks. But thinking about the fusion of artificial intelligence and robotics, thinking about moving from rational to more emotional ways in which robots can connect with people. Actually, the robots I saw most recently were these guys who came from the Skype founders. Um, I found them in Seattle, I found them in a business park of Intuit, and they were delivering sandwiches. So lunchtime robots delivered to you. I also saw, um, when I was in America recently, GM's latest um, driverless car business, which is called Cruise. GM's cruise business has gone from $1 billion valuation to $10.5 billion valuation in just two years. SoftBank from Japan recently chose Cruise, not Google's Waymo, to invest in. So interesting, and who is the leader now in terms of developing? And the Chevy Bolt from GM will soon be available. And as you can see here, there is no driving wheel. There is no console, no pedals. It is purely a recreational space, which is also mobility space. You also saw just one month ago Nintendo launching their new gaming business. This is not about just computer games, but this is about physical interaction at the same time. It's made of cardboard. So what does that show you? That means that people want to play games electronically, but actually they want to interact, they want to make things, they're human. And this is a trend we see all over the place, physical and digital coming together. Does anybody know this company? I'm sure somebody in the room plays eSports. Yeah, so the League of Legends. Typically, it's two people playing a computer game together, probably in their bedroom. Yeah, one person against another person. But now we've got 100,000 people watching them. Why? Well, because we want to be physical in the digital world. Actually, if you think about the music industry, think about the music industry. Who do you think is the most profitable company in the music industry? Anybody guess? Who is the most profitable company in the music industry? Apple. OK, good guess, you're wrong. Who else? Spotify, yeah, that could be the case. You're wrong. <laughs> Google, no. Amazon, that's an inspired thought. Think a bit wider. It's actually Live Nation. Anybody know Live Nation? The world's largest producer of rock concerts. And what happened is as we get, use more and more digital platforms to, to, to receive our music, and the price of digital music goes down and down, for example, with Spotify, to almost nothing, the value or the, the price of a physical event goes up. So as we become more digital, we, we actually value physical experiences more. And most artists today, they use the digital download to promote the physical concert. And so digital supports physical, like the Nintendo, digital and physical coming together. So we see in many different ways, there is no such thing as a digital company. As we become more digital, we become more physical or more human at the same time. It enhances our humanity, our ability to connect and to be emotional and to be ourselves. Actually, being ourselves is really important. I talked about DNA. This is DNA profiling by 23andMe. You can buy it from a pharmacy in many countries of the world today. Not all, but many for $99. It was launched four years ago for $9,000. You can profile your body, you can understand your ancestors, you can understand what you'll die from in the future. And therefore, you can change things. Anne Wajichi, who launched that business, she was able to reduce the cost by changing the business model from 9,000 to 900, and then last year to $99 by being able to aggregate the data and with the permission of the people, 
give that data to insurance companies or pharmaceutical companies, and so she has a double revenue stream. She's making money from the data which she's received from the first customer and giving it to the second customer. So a dual business model we will see more of. But think about how that becomes available to everybody over time, and it will. And therefore, we can predict our future healthcare. And therefore, we can change our lives in many different ways, which is why healthcare will be so fundamental over the next 10 years. Platform technologies, you're all familiar with. You're, we're all familiar with Airbnb, challenging every travel company, hospitality company in the world. Uber, challenging every taxi company in the world. The interesting thing is when you get a platform, which is just lots of suppliers and lots of customers, and you bring them all together, it could even be one person bringing them all together, you have the algorithms, you have the payment system and the brand, then you can do anything. So actually, Uber Eats has become, last December, the largest food delivery company in the world. So from taxi to food delivery. So using the platform to move across markets. Or you think in the world of business to business, construction, tis and crop, every elevator in the world, every elevator in the world you got into in a building, and it goes up and down, up and down, ropes and pulleys. But then tis and crop said, let's take an idea from a different sector, from transport, from Japanese magnetic levitation trains, and let's apply that to the building. And with their magnetic levitation elevators, you can go up and down, but you can go sideways. Has anybody seen Willy Wonka's glass elevator? Yeah, this is it, it's real. It can go sideways, it can take you to your hotel bedroom. And so challenging the conventions, our mindset is the thing which stops us doing things the most. Actually, last um, February in Las Vegas, your story launched uh, the biggest 3D printer in the world. This can now print a home. It can print a home. It was supposed to be for disaster relief in places like the Caribbean hurricanes uh, uh, areas. What's happened is it's become the cool new place, cool new way to build a home in Silicon Valley. You can build a home for $4,000 in 24 hours. And if you don't like it, you can build a different one. <laughs> and you can personalize it to whatever you want. And so using this technology in new ways. Also, in December, the richest man in India, he launched a new telephone called Geophone. He said, I have a dream. I have a dream of becoming the largest mobile phone company in India. Three months later, he had the largest mobile phone company. He gave it to 100 million people. He actually gave it free. So he actually became the largest phone company. He also became the largest advertising platform, which is how he made his money at the same time. So thinking in a different way. And actually, just to demonstrate physical and digital, the most digital company in the world today, Amazon, you know, they realized they need to be more human. I remember as a child, I used to run home from school, and I used to hear the ice cream van. Do you remember that? And the bell ringing, yeah? You remember that. So this is the modern-day ice cream van. It's a tweet on social media or Facebook or Instagram. And, Am uh, and, and Amazon is coming to town. The treasure truck with special offers and pop-up um, parties are coming to town. It's the chance for Amazon to be human. So they were all in the last six months. And in many ways, it shows us anything is possible in the world today. If you have the mindset to believe so. And really, Elon Musk is an example of the, the mindset. So yes, we're all familiar with Tesla cars now. Actually, no longer a startup, but much bigger than Ford in its market capitalization. But then we quickly see some of his other innovations catching on and quickly growing. You know, Hyperloop, the ability to sit in a tube and to float off the ground 1,240 kilometers per hour, 30 minutes from Los Angeles to San Francisco, 11 minutes from Mumbai to Abu Dhabi. I mean, think how long it takes to get to the airport, yeah? <laughs> so 
these are innovations which are currently being built. He has a four-kilometer four test loop currently working in the San Diego desert. The Arab Abu Dhabi Dubai Hyperloop is scheduled to be launched in March 2021, and the Mumbai to Pune Hyperloop in January 2021. That's three years, three years. Think about 10 years, we're now in three years. Think about how that could change. And then we all know about SpaceX being able to go up to the space station, back, turn around 24 hours and come back again. 10 times cheaper than NASA could ever do it. So finding more efficient ways to do it. But actually, you have to be careful. Because every time you innovate, somebody else is trying to innovate too. So just two months ago in New Zealand, a company called Rocket Lab they created the same rocket as Elon Musk's Falcon 9, same specification, 10 times cheaper. So 100 times cheaper than NASA. And they did it with a 3D printer and solar-powered battery. So for $5 million, they've created the space rocket equivalent to Elon Musk. So in this world, you can be the disruptor or you can be disrupted. But the real point, when we say anything is possible, is that it's all about the idea. It's all about how we think. How many people in the room use WhatsApp? Put your hand up if you use WhatsApp. OK, that's 97. Your hand up or down? 97.2%. OK. WhatsApp was created by a Ukrainian refugee, went from Kiev to New York City, a guy called Jan Kuhn, he missed his mum. He wanted to phone his mum. So he created WhatsApp, as you do. Three years later, he sold WhatsApp. Who did he sell it to? Facebook. For how much money? $19 billion. For a company which made how much revenue? Zero. OK. So the economics of that is interesting. But if you think about what Mark Zuckerberg is getting, the connections to all these people for his advertisers, maybe it's worth $19 billion. The most interesting question is how many people worked for WhatsApp in those three years? Have a guess. How many people do you think? 50, good guess. Lower. <laughs> 20, very good guess. Lower. 17. Come on, 17 people. 17 people created $19 billion in three years. Now, how many people are there in the room? What could we do? The point is, you don't need huge companies. You don't need huge investments. You don't need huge amount of resources. You need to think. You need to spot an opportunity of a changing world. Find the insight in terms of how consumers are changing their behavior. And then you need to think about how can you solve that problem in some interesting way. Often find a partner to do it with. It's not about waiting for huge investment and resources and people and all the rest of it. It's about the ideas. What's interesting about all of these companies is they use networks. And networks are really important because the network effect is something which amplifies, multiplies the power of your business. Think about it. If you can talk to one customer and each of those customers talk to 10 customers and they talk to 10 customers, it has an amplifying effect. But firstly, you have to connect your customers together. You have to create a network. We have social media, we have distribution networks, we have licensed franchise networks. But how do you use your networks in your business? Both your product and service networks, but also your distribution and support networks. And how can you start to amplify the impact using networks? You know, Robert Metcalf, he was the founder of 3Com. He created a law called Metcalf's Law. It's, you know, you've heard of Moore's Law. That uh, computing power doubles every 18 months. 
But if you think about Metcalfe's law, it says the value of a network is proportional to the square of the nodes. Do you understand that? So every time you add an extra person to a network, you get a multiplication of the connections. The connections are the most important thing. And if you think about that, just as a simple example, think about folding a piece of paper. If you were to fold a piece of paper, and you were to fold a piece of paper three times, fold it three times, it's still pretty thin, yeah? And it's actually eight sheets of paper there because it's multiplying in terms of the numbers of paper. If you were to fold it, if you were to continue folding that seven times, you get the thickness of a notebook. If you were to fold a piece of paper 10 times, the multiplication effect, it would be thickness of a hand. If you were to fold it 17 times, this is true, <laughs> it would be the height of a two-story house. And if you were to fold it 30 times, it would be ten the diameter of planet Earth. So that might sound crazy, check it out online. But the idea of the multiplication impact of networks becomes really important. So to me, businesses today, you know, we see these companies, Airbnb, $45 billion in seven years, Uber, $72 billion in eight years, Alibaba, $470 billion in 13 years, Amazon, $940 billion in 24 years, they all work exponentially. And what do they do? There's two things to me which are the ingredients of success. One is an idea which comes from an insight. So it's not a technology, it's an idea. An idea which makes people's lives better normally. And then the second thing is they use networks. So ideas and networks are really the ingredients of success today. If you look at all the technologies the challenge for all of us is to think, how do we use those technologies, be it the internet or mobile or robotics, blockchain, whatever, not just to create some product which looks nice or sounds good, but to solve a problem. How can we solve a problem which makes the world better in some way? So really what we should be doing is saying, what are the problems of the world? What are the problems of urbanization or emerging middle classes or ownership to access or, or whatever it might be? And then by applying technology to a problem, that's the way to get an innovation. That's the way we fundamentally create something which is important to the world, an innovation which is important to the world. And that's really the background to how Google innovates, for example. When I wrote my last book, I went and talked to 100 companies. Google was one of them. Anybody work with Google? No. So I went to the main building. That's not where I needed to go. I actually went about 300 meters around the corner to a small building, gray building. It's called the Moonshot Factory. Sounds good, yeah? The Moonshot Factory is where they create the next generation of Google's ideas. So things like um, uh, elevators, which take you up into space. Things like contact lenses, which measure your entire body, vital statistics. Looking at cures for cancer. The next generation of Google Glass. All sorts of things. To be honest, I did not really understand it. I've got a PhD in physics, but I did not understand most of what they were talking about. But then I looked on the walls, on all the walls around the Moonshot factory, and this was the statement which all of them had. It said, why be 10% better? You remember 10% better? Like we keep trying to be 10% better? Why be 10% better when you could be 10 times better. Now that's quite interesting because most of us settle for just small improvements. But if you give yourself a big, daring challenge to say, let's grow our customer base 10 times, let's reduce our cost 10 times, let's increase our speed to market 10 times. If you give yourself that challenge, you will probably solve the problem in a different way from otherwise. 
So I thought that was quite interesting in terms of the technique they use to stretch people. It takes them to the future in some ways, but it takes them to a bigger idea, a more ambitious challenge. So use that yourself. What could you do 10 times better? Even if you end up with two times better, it's still better than 10%. So thinking in a different way. And then I went when many other companies across the world, in every different sector, consumer and business companies, and I looked at how are they using innovation techniques to change their industries. And I called these companies game changers. You can see all of those different companies. There's 120 different companies there. They don't all come from America, you know, like the old textbooks. They're not all big companies like the textbooks always tell you about. Many of them are small companies, some of them are mid-sized companies, and some of them are big companies. And we talked about companies like GE who are reinventing themselves. But what's really interesting is they come from every part of the world. And the best thing of all is that you could learn from every one of these companies, consumer or industrial companies. You can learn from the business models, the innovation process, the ways in which they reinvent their products and services, the way in which they communicate with people or distribute, they use networks, you could learn from everyone. You can learn nothing from your competitors. You can learn nothing from your competitors. You're all the same. But look beyond that to what's happening in the world and think about how can I take ideas from other places. That's what you will find inspiring. These companies are audacious. That's what you need to be to win in the world today. Audacious means big, daring, bold ideas, like the 10% moonshots, not 10 times, of Google. Secondly, they use the power of networks, values proportional to the square of the nodes. They use the power of all types of networks, the connections between people. Thirdly, they use intelligence, data and artificial intelligence, to be smarter, predictive, personal. Fourthly, they're collaborative. Collaborative between businesses, partner to partner, but also consumer to consumer or customer to customer, and business to customer. So they work together. Their creativity comes from the connections between each other. And finally, speed. They find new ways to make things happen in this next 10 years of incredible growth. They find ways to make things happen faster. So I want to leave you before we go off to the innovation lounges with a couple of thoughts. Firstly is this. Welcome to Tomorrowland. Tomorrowland was a movie, you might have seen it, with George Clooney. Anybody seen that movie? Yeah. And you have a little pin, yeah? You have a little pin, and when you pick up that pin and you hold it, it takes you to the future. What we all need is a little pin like this, which takes us to the future, not just once every five years when we do our strategy or even once a year when we do our business planning, but keeps taking us to the future. What will our future look like? And then start working back from there in terms of what it looks like. Future back planning is the most important technique for you today. Never ever do your business plan, your business strategy by saying, where are we now? How do we make it a bit better? Never ever, like Philip Kotler said, use your core competence of the past and say, how can we keep using that? Because that was the thing which made you successful in the past. Instead, jump to the future and then work backwards and think, well, how can I do things differently and then work forwards? You know, this is what Richard Branson always does. His provocation, his catholic nature to his company, I work with him a lot, is to challenge ideas, to say crazy things, to stretch the ambition. And that should be your responsibility in your company too. To dream about the future. So think about the future. Use five years. You know, 10 years is a long time, so use five years. It's more practical for your business to plan. So think about 2023. What's my vision of 2023? Then think, well, if that's my vision of 2023, what's my vision of 2021 in order to get to 23? And then think about, well, what's 2019 in order to get to 2021 to get to 23? It will change your view 
of next year. And then think about, well, okay, what activities do I need to do to deliver each of those goals? And then think about what will the results look like? And you can tell your analysts or investors or owners, what will the results be delivered? What will you do in that future place? So working from the future back becomes incredibly important. And then find people to help you make it happen. Number two to take away is do not think about the technology. Do not think about the product. Think about the customer's world. We are all obsessed with our own businesses. We're obsessed with our products. We think our product is the most important thing to our customers. It's not. They care about their world. They care about their customers, how they can grow their business, how they can bring together your product with lots of other things and solve important problems in the world. So think from the customer perspective, much more importantly. You know, I worked recently with Harley Davidson. Does anybody have a Harley Davidson? Yes, you do. Excellent. Fantastic. You're the man. OK, because we did some research and, sorry, what's your name? Sorry? Stefan, yes. You see, what the research found was that people like Stefan are 55-year-old accountants. with bald hair, with no hair. And this is the typical Harley Davidson owner. They actually don't care about the bike. The bike's not a very good bike. You can buy a better bike from other places. But they care about something else. They love, Stefan, dressing in black leather. <laughs> and they love riding through small towns and scaring the shit out of young children. I mean, that's what Harley Davidson drivers love. They love the freedom of doing something unusual, exceptional. And if you look at Harley Davidson, the company, the most profitable business unit is, it's not merchandising, that's number two. Number one is Harley Holidays, Stefan does it every year, where these bald accountants go together on vacation and they scare the shit out of young children in black leather. Number three to take away, I apologize, is solve an important problem. Don't just think about making money. Solve an important problem. So think about a big human challenge. How can you apply technology to the human challenge and then be audacious, radical innovation? You know, one of the biggest problems we have today is the plastic in the ocean, the amount of plastic bottles, and the amount of fishing nets made of plastic which are in the ocean, the huge amount of non-degradable waste. So Adidas, Adidas came along and they said, hey, we can use this. We can use this plastic, which is not biodegradable in simple ways, and we can use a technique in our new speed factory in Germany, and we'll use 3D printing technology, and we'll work with a company in the Netherlands, an NGO, to get the plastic, to take it to our factory, to reproduce it or reprint it and create high technology fabrics. And from that, they created this range of sports shoe. It's called Adidas Pali. It is the most expensive range of sports shoes ever. The price was on average 350 euros per pair. Have you ever paid that much? No. So they launched them. They sold out in 24 hours because they're cool. Yeah, they save the world, they're high performance, they're the best of both things. They launched another range, it sold out in 24 hours. And this is the most successful range of shoes Adidas have ever produced. So solve an important problem. Number four, think about how you can redesign your business model. The best form of innovation today is not innovating your product or your service or even your customer experience. It's about innovating your business model. You saw lots and lots of examples there. You could choose any business model for your business. Don't just think about selling products. That is so old and lazy. Think instead about different ways you can get value from your customers and give value to them. You know, if you think about that Tesla car, 
Behind the Tesla car is a very interesting business model. You know, Tesla sells the car to the customer. When it sells the car, it usually sells a power plant. The customer comes together in a community because they, they, they love their cars together. They then charge their car. They either have their own charging on the, um, charger on the wall, or they go to a supercharger network. You can pay a premium to get a battery swap, which saves time. You can also get free service and downloads to update your car at the same time. So the business model works like that. What's really interesting is how they gave their technology away, their IP, their patents away to other companies. So giving their charging capability away to BMW or to Toyota, and then selling a Tesla power plant to a Toyota or a BMW driver. Now, why did they do that? Well, yes, it's more money. But actually, Tesla has a vision, a five-year vision. In five years, most people will not own a car. They'll probably rent a car or subscribe to a, a mobility solution. So which company will they subscribe to? Well, they thought about this. And then they looked at something like mobile phones. I mean, none of us actually buy a mobile phone from Apple or Samsung or um, either manufacturers. We actually buy it from the network operator, the phone operator. So who will be the network operator of the automotive world? And that's what Tesla is trying to do, to create the de facto network which every car owner or user, rather, can use, and they're subscribed to that network for the future. Number five is then about doing innovation faster and more experimentally. You know, GE reduced its time to market from three years to three months by using a combination of design thinking and lean implementation. Those two things together, the ability to test and learn, test and learn very, very quickly with your customer. But the most important thing of all is not just the learning, it's actually as you scale up, how you prepare to keep changing. So this idea of being agile in the way you hack the future of your car, your, your, your product or service. So being able to constantly evolve your business or change your business over time is perhaps the most important thing. And those three circles together, so the design thinking plus the lean implementation plus the agile hacking is Amazon's strategy for success, which has delivered $970 billion in, four years, in 24 years. And you can see some of their experiments here. Number six, perhaps the most important for all of us in the room here, is about you don't need to do it yourself. One of the most exciting things which you can take from today's world is that actually it's more important to have the idea and then to find other people to develop that idea with you. So partners matter more than ever. So call it an ecosystem or call it collaboration, whatever. Using partnerships to share the way you succeed, to share the vision, you know, two minds are more successful than one, to share the risk, share the reward, but everything working together. Leonardo da Vinci said innovation is about bringing together unusual ideas, so bringing together unusual partners to achieve more together. If you look at a company like Arm, you know, I said Arm is three times more successful than Intel. That's because it doesn't make anything itself. It works with a whole range of partners in order to make things together. And therefore, it can be much more agile, it can be much more personalized, it can be much more reactive, and they and their partners can be more successful. So a very different model of success. And the final one, as you start thinking about food and drink, is your mindset. There are two types of people in the room, in any room. There are those people who believe in perfection who believe keep working at it, keep working at it, keep working at it, and make it perfect, make it more efficient, make it even better, make it perfect. They're obsessive about keeping going with the same thing to make it perfect. These are the ones who stretch the past success model because that's what made them successful before. They have a fixed mindset. 
There are other people in the world who have a different mindset, who constantly want to, to, to try new things. They want to experiment. They're constantly learning to grow themselves and therefore to grow their business. Failure is their route to success. So thinking in a very different way. And perhaps no better to demonstrate that growth mindset, which hopefully you will all have, than the school teacher who used to earn $1,000 a year and now has $970 billion in his pocket. He says, perhaps one of his most important things, it's always day one. It is never, ever day two in Alibaba. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, if you think about day one, what happens on day one? Day one, you come into a new job. You're excited, yeah? You've got vision, you've got passion, yeah? You want to make new ideas happen. What happens on day two? You get all the shit, yeah. So you get the piles of paper, you get all the reasons you can't make those things happen. Never, ever let it be day two in your business. You always want it to be day one. Always have your head up, not your head down. Always be dreaming about the future, not thinking about the past. Always be thinking about what could we do, not what we can't do. So always think in that positive, forwards-looking way and think about starting to make the future happen now. So what will you do? When you go away from Kaba and this fantastic celebration, what will you do together in the future? Well, hopefully this is your brain. Right now, this is your brain. You're making sense of change. Actually, the competitive advantage today is the person who can see the future better, who can understand the future opportunities best. Secondly, shape the future to your advantage. None of that stuff will happen because somebody will make it happen. It'll only happen if somebody chooses to make it happen, and it could be you. So shape the future to your advantage. Thirdly, have a passion for making life better. Every company in some way is about making life better. It's actually the mission of Kaba. Connect unusual ideas, unusual people, unusual partners. Act with speed and agility. Have that audacious moonshot 10 times attitude and be persistent. Be persistent in making it happen. And most of all, for all of us in the room, we are the change. It's not somebody else. It's not our organizations. It starts actually with us. Our behaviors, our attitudes, our dreams, our language, what we say yes to and what we say no to, how we spend our time. So like Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in your world. So, three final thoughts. Be bold, be brave, and be brilliant. Thank you very much.